It is time to talk about Luftwaffe war crimes during World War II. This is a topic that is highly charged, so I am going to rely heavily on quotes here from experts in the subject. With the Luftwaffe, it's an incredibly nuanced and difficult subject where you have to wade through levels of complexity starting at the ideological over to the organizational and then the individual level. The Luftwaffe was one part of the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht was the official German armed force in the Second World War, but does not account for other military and paramilitary organizations that were also engaged in combat, like the Reichsarbeitsdienst, the Reichslabor Service, the Volkssturm, the police and the Waffen-SS. The Wehrmacht had three branches, the Army, das Heer, the Navy, die Kriegsmarine and the Air Force, die Luftwaffe. As such, the Luftwaffe is part of the armed forces and was also a part of the National Socialist apparatus between its founding in 1945 over to the end in 1945. This can be clearly seen with the commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, who was not just in command of the Luftwaffe, but also the deputy of Adolf Hitler since 1939, and who was fully aware of and clearly implicated in the atrocities Germany committed throughout this time. While the individual acts of Luftwaffe personnel are one thing, they were part of an army branch and an overall organization with the Wehrmacht in which the promotion of national socialist ideology was an integral part and they were, ultimately, defending the system. To start, let us ask the question, what is a war crime? There are varying definitions. Looking at one of the official definitions, at Nuremberg the following acts within the jurisdiction of the tribunal were considered crimes for which there can be individual responsibility. Crimes against peace, namely planning, preparation, initiation or the waging of a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements or assurances. Or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. War crimes? namely violations of the laws or customs of war, such violations shall include, but are not limited to, murder, ill-treatment or deportation to slave labor of civilian populations, murder or the ill-treatment of prisoners of war, killing of hostages, plunder of public and private property, wanton destruction of cities, towns or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity. Crimes against humanity, namely murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war, or persecution on political, racial or religious grounds, whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country where perpetrated. With the Luftwaffe, here is a list of the possible subjects that I could talk about when it comes to war crimes, although this does not cover every case. Terror bombing anti-partisan warfare, slave labor in factories, ghetto revolt suppression, experiments and concentration camps for aeronautical purposes, participation in war crimes in the field by Luftwaffe Felddivisionen, the field divisions of the Luftwaffe, and the treatment of prisoners of war. In this video, first I will look at terror bombings. After that, I will concentrate on slave labor, the experiments conducted in concentration camps and the treatment of POWs. As such, this video is an overview and not an exhaustive study of the subject. In the literature surrounding World War II, the subject of terror bombings continues to be an intensely debated topic and it is something that continuously flares up to this present day, often overshadowing other subjects. Talking about the post-war West German discussion on bombing during World War II, the historian Bender Beckmann notes, in the distinction between air raids, the historical context of the Second World War was largely lost and other forms of total warfare and the crimes committed by Nazism and the Wehrmacht were ignored. The bombing war was seen as the most elementary moral question of the Second World War. How much the debate continues into the present is clear because often one cannot mention German attacks on Guernica, Warsaw, Rotterdam, the Blitz, the attack on Belgrade, the Bedecker raids or the V-weapons without someone else bringing up Hamburg, Köln or Dresden. The way the Allied air raids were compared with the German bombings on cities like Rotterdam and Warsaw relates to the question of guilt and responsibility. However, this video is about the Luftwaffe, so I will focus on purely the German side. 
The historiography highlights how complex the issue is and that while some attacks are very clear cut, others are somewhat nuanced. This shines through in the surrounding historical literature that continues to debate the nature of bombing attacks like on Warsaw 1949, Rotterdam 1940 and the Battle of Britain and the Blitz in 1940 through 1941. Take Warsaw and Rotterdam for example. Both cities highlight the complexity of the issue. On Warsaw, the British historian Richard Overy notes that On the 16th of September, the Polish commander in Warsaw was given six hours to surrender. He refused, declaring the capital to be a special military zone. As Warsaw was a defended city, it was legitimate for German air forces to join the German army artillery in the siege. On Rotterdam, Overy notes that like the bombing of Warsaw, the operations against Rotterdam imposed heavy civilian casualties because the Dutch army chose to defend the area rather than declare it an open city or surrender. In both cases substantial damage and death were also caused by artillery fire. This might make the attack look unambiguous, but it's worth remembering a few things on top of this. First, there were, even at the time, certain rules of engagement and an overall consensus that civilians cannot be simply collateral damage when trying to fulfill the intended military objective. Bombardments, including aerial bombardments, need to focus specifically on military targets, even in defended cities. There existed opinions that the Hague Convention did not apply to the air war, contrary to the stance and interpretation relating to the general spirit that followed out of this accord. In addition, the reference on the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience is clear. It clearly states that all acts of war are subordinate to these principles. These are also known as the Martens Clause within the preamble of the 1899 and 1907 Hague Convention, although in the 1907 version the requirements of the public conscience were changed to the dictates of the public conscience. Second, as Hermann Knell points out, the people of Holland and the citizens of Rotterdam in particular had suffered losses that in a nation observing strict neutrality should never have been inflicted. Third, it is worth remembering how German wartime propaganda presented these attacks. They were clearly exploited by the Luftwaffe and Nazi regime as a model example of what would happen to those that opposed Germany. The German Air Force itself made the most of its contribution to victory in Poland and in doing so helped to nurture the myth of Warsaw's destruction from the air. In November 1949, the new Reich Kommissar of the Polish general government, Hans Frank, hosted neutral diplomats and military attaches formally accredited to Warsaw at a reception in the former capital. In his address, he asked them to examine closely the extensive bomb damage in Warsaw. As a result of their observations, he suggested they should recommend to their respective governments to intercede for peace. It is thus clear, especially within the spirit of the laws and customs of war that were agreed upon at the time, that these attacks cannot be simply excused by citing military necessity. Over the following years, we also see a clear and intentional escalation in violence. One early example would be Belgrade, 1941. Three days before the attack, Belgrade was declared an open city and because the city didn't even have any air defense, this unannounced bombing attack broke the rules of engagement and is unquestionably a war crime. This incident is noteworthy as the commanding Luftwaffe officer at the time, General Alexander Löhr, was tried, sentenced and executed for his role in the attack and later anti-partisan operations by Yugoslavia. This is also seen with the Bedecka raids that inflicted damage to British cities and towns in 1942. Hitler's headquarters ordered the Oberbefehlshaber der Luftwaffe on 14th of April to give the air war against England a more aggressive stamp, adding, when targets are being selected, preference is to be given to those where attacks are likely to have the greatest possible effect on civilian life. The military value of these raids is more than questionable. The purposely inflicted damage to select cities of cultural and historic value in Great Britain that in themselves had no real military significance clearly constitutes as a terror campaign. The Vergeltungswaffen or vengeance weapons probably need no introduction, but I want to mention them briefly. Between 1944 and its retreat in the West, Germany began to increasingly target cities with V1 and V2 rockets. As the Germans continued their retreat back into the Reich, 
they threw everything they had left into the V-weapons arsenal against England. The V-2 weapons had killed 2,754 people and seriously injured 6,523. Flying bombs had killed 6,184 and seriously injured 17,981. The Vergeltungswaffen were also of further notoriety as their fabrication drew upon a large host of slave labor, which became ever more important to the German war industry that supplied the Luftwaffe, as noted by Daniel Usil. Large proportions of highly proficient German personnel had been replaced by late 1944 with foreign manpower composed of, amongst others, large numbers of Jewish housewives and teenage schoolgirls picked up in places like Auschwitz. The massive use of slave labor became within months a central characteristic of this branch. In comparison to the other German military branches, the historian Constanze Werner established that forced labor and concentration camp inmates were employed so massively, so early and so unscrupulously in the aviation industry like in no other industrial branch. I will now move on to the next subject, namely human experiments. The Luftwaffe conducted human experimentation on Allied POWs and concentration camp victims for aeronautical gains. During the Second World War, 540 prisoners in the concentration camp Dachau were forced to take part in medical experiments for aeronautics. Around 200 of these would become victims of low pressure chambers between February and June 1942. At least 70 did not survive. 300 prisoners had to endure the ordeals of hypothermia experiments in ice water and the outside cold between August 1942 and March 1943. 80 to 90 were killed. In the summer of 1944, 40 further prisoners were studied to find alternative solutions in making seawater drinkable. Some suffered permanent damages. I will now go through these experiments in turn. Because the oxygen concentration and pressure drops with altitude, Planes are equipped with oxygen supplies and pressurized cabins that allow the pilot to operate at higher altitudes. These had some limitations, thus the Luftwaffe investigated the possibility of finding alternative solutions to increase the altitude planes and pilots could operate in. Since the Luftwaffe failed to find volunteers for the experiments, the medical officer of the Luftwaffe, Dr. Sigmund Rascher, contacted Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler with a request in 1941. Russia opened the gate to the concentration camp Dachau. He asks Himmler if two or three criminals could be made available for research purposes. The experiments through which the test subjects can naturally die would be conducted through me. For test subjects, people with mental disabilities can also be used. Tests commenced in 1942, and from the start, more than just two or three men were used. The test subjects are Poles, Russians, and Jews. They are to be between 20 to 40 years old, completely healthy, in good nutritional condition and physical shape. This is why they receive bigger food rations before the experiments. The test subjects are strapped into a parachute within a steel chamber. The test subjects will be, with or without oxygen supply, artificially raised into altitudes up to 21 kilometers. They are plummeted or raised. The results? Cramps, paralysis, blindness, madness, death. Some prisoners will be used again after surviving a test. Considering the fate of the survivors, there seems to be some disagreement. Around 180 to 200 prisoners will be abused in the experiments. Around 10 had volunteered and one was pardoned after the tests and sent to the penal brigade Dillewanger. 70 to 80 test subjects died. Other sources also indicate that some of these men that survived the sessions are executed or shot afterwards. The next run of experiments was conducted on hypothermia and saltwater consumption to find ways to increase the survival rate of German airmen that were shot down over the ocean. The tests of hypothermia commenced shortly after the high altitude experiments in August 1942. The test subjects are forced into a water top of 2x2x2 two by two by two meters in which ice blocks are continuously added. The water temperatures fluctuate between 2.3 to 12 degrees. The people are naked or wear a flight suit. Some tests are started under narcosis, others not. During sickness or collapse, stimulants are given. If the body temperature drops by one degree, blood and by means of a catheter, urine samples are taken. Cerebrospinal fluid is tapped at the head and back. For the saltwater experiment, 40 men brought in from a concentration camp 
This is Auschwitz, not Dachau this time, were forced to drink differently prepared seawater for a period of up to three weeks. These tests are discussed within a circle of 20 to 40 doctors. Dr. Konrad Schäfer, Dr. Beigelberg showed the convention a series of graphical depictions that demonstrated urine and blood samples from test subjects who had to drink Berkatit seawater. This is a specially prepared chemical mixture designed in the hope to make seawater drinkable. At the same time, photographies and films are shown. Additionally, Dr. Beigelberg reported that due to the tests, liver swellings and nerve disorders occurred. Delirium and mental dysfunctions also occurred. It is worth noting that on all these medical experiments that at the time, the moral code was not that different from nowadays. Already before the Codex of Nuremberg, before the Declaration of Geneva, before the advice of the German Medical Associations to doctors on the conduct of scientific experiments on human, and before the Declaration of Helsinki and Tokyo, a clear sentiment on the ethical problems of human experiments existed. As such, the behavior of these doctors and scientists cannot be explained by assuming a different moral compass, one that did not exist. During the Nuremberg doctor trials of 1946 to 1947, only 23 scientists and doctors were accused. Seven were acquitted and seven received death sentences, the rest prison sentences. Of the many other doctors involved, most were able to continue practice in medicine. Let us talk about the treatment of prisoners of war next. The great majority of Allied air crews were held prisoner by the Luftwaffe in one of the purpose-built Stalag Luft prisons. This is short for Stammlager from the longer Kriegsgefangenenmannschaft Stammlager. One exception were Soviet prisoners. While overall the treatment of Western air crews is portrayed in popular culture as relatively humane, at the end of the war the Luftwaffe forcibly marched Allied POWs from their prisons to prevent them from being liberated. In 1945, the American legation in Bern, Switzerland, noted that about 100,000 prisoners are moving along the northern German coast to the west. The great mass of prisoners are now rest between New Brandenburg and Schweinmünde. The rear guard is still at, on the roads west of Danzig. The prisoners will continue their march westwards until they reach the region of Hamburg. The prisoners' rations consist of one quart of hot water and three potatoes daily plus 200 grams of bread every five days, when available. Frostbite, exposure, malnutrition, dysentery, and pneumonia were commonplace. During these marches, either due to inadequate treatment or the use of violence, an estimated 2,000 to 3,000 Allied POWs died. As for the treatment of Soviet POWs by the Luftwaffe, I couldn't find much. However, the overall treatment of Soviet prisoners in the Wehrmacht was terrible and only improved when Germany started using them for slave labor, something pointed out by Military History Visualized in his overview video on Wehrmacht war crimes, which I encourage you to watch after this video. However, during my research I found the Merkblatt 205, Merkblatt für den Arbeitseinsatz der sowjetischen Kriegsgefangenen im Bereich der Luftwaffe. Notice 205 the notice for the work assignment of Soviet prisoners of war within the domain of the Luftwaffe. This is from December 1943, and thus from the time when the German army started to increasingly use Soviet prisoners for slave labor. So many of the provisions are concerned with keeping the POWs in a condition that would allow them to continue working. For example, it states that Discipline among Soviet prisoners of war must be maintained with strictness but fairness. During punishment, a health impairment must be avoided in the interest of maintaining an ability to work. However, it goes on with the following passages that highlight that ultimately little leeway or care was given in terms of discipline or punishment. Punishments are not linked to the regulations for German soldiers. The punishment must be felt as unpleasant based on Soviet mentalities and habits. During resistance or threatening behavior, a ruthless crackdown is in order. Against mutiny and immediate use of firearms, in emergency use of MG and grenades are required. This was an overview of some of the war crimes conducted by the Luftwaffe during World War II. To summarize, it is rather clear that the Luftwaffe as an organization between the years of 1935 to 1945, specifically at the very top and with its high-ranking commanders, gave orders and conducted acts that were clearly criminal and immoral also by the standards of the time.